ஹலோ ஃப்ரெண்ட்ஸ் வெல்கம் டு சங்கர் ஐஏஎஸ் அகாடமி டெய்லி நியூஸ் பேப்பர் அனாலிசிஸ் டுடே ஸ்டேட் இஸ் டுவெண்ட்டி எயிட் சிக்ஸ் டுவெண்ட்டி டுவெண்ட்டி ஃபோர் பிஹைண்ட் மீ ஆர் த லிஸ்ட் ஆஃப் ஆர்டிகல்ஸ் தட் யூர் அபவுட் டு டிஸ்கஸ் டுடே ஸோ வித் அவுட் மஸ்ட் டிலே லெட்ஸ் கெட் ஸ்டார்ட் பிஃபோர் கெட்டிங் இன் டு டுடேஸ் நியூஸ் பேப்பர் டிஸ்கஷன் லெட் சி த ஆன்சர் கீ ஃபார் த எஸ்டர்டேஸ் கொஸ்டின் லுக் அட் திஸ் கொஸ்டின் வித் ரெஃபரன்ஸ் டு இந்தியாஸ் ரெனியூவபிள் எனர்ஜி டெவலப்மெண்ட் ஏஜென்சி லிமிடெட் ஐஆர்இடிஏ விச் ஆஃப் த ஃபாலோயிங் ஸ்டேட்மெண்ட்ஸ் ஆர் கரெக்ட் இட் இஸ் அ பப்ளிக் லிமிடெட் கவர்மெண்ட் கம்பெனி ஸ்டேட்மெண்ட் டூ இட் இஸ் அ நான் பேங்கிங் ஃபினான்ஷியல் கம்பெனி செலக்ட் த கரெக்ட் ஆன்சர் யூசிங் த கிவன் கோட் பிலோ ஒன் ஒன்லி டூ ஒன்லி போத் ஒன் அண்ட் டூ நெய்தர் ஒன் நாட் டூ த கரெக்ட் ஆன்சர் இஸ் ஆப்ஷன் சி போத் ஒன் அண்ட் டூ சி ஐஆர்இடிஏ இஸ் அ மினி ரத்னா கேட்டகரி ஒன் நான் பேங்கிங் ஃபினான்ஷியல் இன்ஸ்டியூஷன் அண்டர் த அட்மினிஸ்ட்ரேட்டிவ் கண்ட்ரோல் ஆஃப் Ministry of New and Renewable Energy Resources. It is a public limited government company established as a NBFC in 1987. Moreover, it has been notified as a public financial institution under the Section 4A of Companies Act 1956. Let's now see the second question. Consider the following statement. In the first Lok Sabha, the single largest party in the opposition was Swadhandra Party. In the Lok Sabha, a leader of opposition was recognized for the first time in 1969. In the Lok Sabha if a party does not have a minimum of 75 members its leader cannot be recognized as a leader of opposition which of the statements given above are correct option a 1 and 3 only option b 2 only option c 2 and 3 only option d 1 2 and 3 the correct answer is option b 2 only see the statement 1 it is wrong as communist party of india was the single largest party in the opposition the third statement is also wrong because as we know that the leader of largest opposition party which is not having less than 1/10th of the total membership of the house is elected as the leader of opposition in that house so the statement 2 alone is correct because in the lok sabha the leader of opposition was recognized for the first time in 1969 so with this let's get into today's newspaper discussion Look at this article. It talks about the demand of BJP leader in Kashmir to end India's engagement with Pakistan in the Indus Water Treaty. See this is the crux of this article. In this backdrop, let us discuss about River Indus and its tributaries. See the River Indus is also known as Sindhu. It is the westernmost Himalayan river of India. It originates from Bokarchu glacier in the northern slope of Mount Kailash, which is 6700 meters height. After originating in Mount Kailash, the river flows through the trans himalayan ranges of karakoram ladakh and zaskar in tibet indus is also known as singhi kamban or the lion's mouth after flowing in the northwest direction between ladakh and zaskar ranges it passes through ladakh and baltistan it cuts across ladakh range forming a spectacular gorge near gilgit in jammu kashmir region then it enters pakistan near chilar in dardistan region an important point to be noted is that the indus flows in india only through lay district in jammu kashmir now let us see the tributaries of indus see the indus receives number of tributaries like shayok gilgit zaskar hunza nubra shigar gasting and dras moreover when it finally emerges from the hills near atok in pakistan it receives kabul river on the right bank the other important tributaries joining the right bank of the indus are kuram the tochi the gomal the viboa and the sangar note that all these rivers originate in the sulaiman ranges of afghanistan then it flows southward and receives panjnar a little above mithankot note that panjnar is the name given to the five rivers of punjab namely satluj bias the ravi and chenab and jhelum let us have a brief look on panjnar for our understanding firstly let us take up jhelum the river jhelum rises from the spring at verinag which is situated at the foot of Pirpanjal range then it flows through Srinagar and the Volgar lake before entering Pakistan through the deep narrow gorge see the jhelum forms a natural boundary between india and pakistan after entering pakistan the jhelum river joins the chenab near jang in pakistan now moving on to the chenab river note that the chenab is the largest tributary of the river indus it originates from the zaskar range in himachal pradesh it is formed by the two streams that is the chandra and baga which joins at tandi in himachal pradesh hence chenab is also known as chandra baga the river flows for 1180 km before entering into pakistan like we have already saw jhelum joins the chenab near jang in pakistan now let us take the river ravi see the river ravi originates west of rohtang pass in kulu hills of himachal pradesh it flows through chamba valley of himachal pradesh moreover in india it flows between the pirpanjal range 
and the Dauladar range. Also note that it forms a natural boundary between India and Pakistan. The river enters Pakistan and merges with the Chenab near Sarai Sindhu in Pakistan. Now let us see about the river Bias. The river Bias originates from the Bias Kun near the Rotang Pass at an elevation of 4000 meter above the mean sea level. It flows through Kulu Valley and forms a gorge at Katti and Largi in the Dauladar range. It enters the Punjab plains where it meets Sutlaj near Harike. So, of the five major tributaries of Indus, only Bias has its entire basin in India. Now, moving on to the Sutlaj. See, the Sutlaj originates in Rakas Lake near Manasarovar at an altitude of 4,555 meter in Tibet. In Tibet, the Sutlaj is also known as Longchen Kambab. Initially, the river flows almost parallel to the Indus for about 400 km before entering India. Sutlaj enters India by forming a gorge at Rupar Himachal Pradesh. It passes through Shipkila and the Himalayan ranges and enters the Punjab plains. Note that this river feeds the canal system of Bakranangal project. So that's all about this article. With this, let's move to the next news discussion. Look at this news article. The Competition Commission of India has dismissed a complaint against Google India regarding the allegation that it has abused its dominant position to favor true caller in the market. The CCI dismissed the petition by saying that it has found no evidence of violation of competition law. This is the crux of this news article. In this backdrop, let us see about Competition Commission of India. See, the Competition Commission of India is a statutory body that was established under the Competition Act 2002. It was amended by the Competition Act 2007. Its main goal is to create and sustain fair competition in the economy that will provide a level playing field to the producers and make the market work for the welfare of the consumers. So, the Act prohibits anti-competitive agreements, abuse of dominant position by the enterprise and it also regulates acquisition which causes or likely to cause an adverse effect on the competition within India. Now let's see its composition. It consists of chairperson and six members appointed by the central government. On talking about their qualification, the chairperson and every other member should be the person of ability, integrity, special knowledge and professional experience of not less than 15 years in the areas like international trade, economics, business, commerce, law, finance, accountancy, management, industry, public affairs or the competition matters including competition law and policy. Both the chairperson and other members will be appointed by the central government based on the recommendation of the selection committee headed by the Chief Justice of India or his nominee. The other members include the Secretary in the Ministry of Corporate Affairs and the Secretary in the Ministry of Law and Justice. Apart from them, two experts possessing a special knowledge and professional experience are also a part of this committee. Note, the chairperson and every other members hold the office for a term of five years provided they have not attained the age of 65 and they are eligible for reappointment. In case of vacancy caused by resignation or the removal of chairperson or any other member, then the position shall be filled by a fresh appointment based on the committee recommendation. And in case of vacancy in the chairperson's office, the senior most member shall act as the chairperson until the new person is chosen. So that's all about this article. With this, let's move on to our next discussion. Look at this editorial article from The Hindu. It is about the recent incident where Sri Lankan sailor died when the Sri Lankan Navy tried to chase away Indian fishing boats from their waters. Ten Indian fishermen were arrested and Tamil Nadu's Chief Minister M.K. Stalin has asked Indian External Affairs Minister S. Jay Shankar to help them to release the Indian fishermen. This incident highlights ongoing fishing dispute between India and Sri Lanka, which worsened after the boundary agreements in the 1970s. See, Indian fishermen crossing into Sri Lankan waters is illegal but it is also important to protect their livelihood and marine life. This article suggests Indian fishermen should stop using harmful bottom trawling and switch to other methods like deep sea fishing and marine farming. However, the current project to help them switch has not been very successful. It also emphasizes the need for India and Sri Lanka to restart the talks to resolve the fishing dispute involving representatives from both countries and affected regions. This is the crux of this editorial article. So with this understanding, let us learn few concepts mentioned here. First one is bottom trawling. See, bottom trawling is a fishing method where large net is dragged along the seafloor. This net captures everything in its path. 
including fish and other marine life. This practice is widely criticized because it can destroy sea habitat such as coral reefs which are crucial for marine life. Additionally, bottom trawling often results in bycatch where unwanted species including endangered ones are caught and discarded. This contributes to overfishing as it captures all kinds of sea life depleting fish population. Furthermore, the method stirs up sediments on the sea floor, releasing pollutants trapped in these sediments, thereby contributing to marine pollution. But still, fishermen are using this. Let's see why. Know that bottom trawling can catch large quantities of fish quickly. It is used to catch bottom dwelling species like shrimp, cod and flounder. For some fishing communities, it is a significant source of income due to its large hulls. Now let us see about Deep Sea Fishing See, Deep Sea Fishing is a method of fishing that takes place in the deeper part of the ocean. This practice actually offers several positives. Let's see them one by one. Firstly, it can be more sustainable if done carefully, targeting specific species without harming the environment. Secondly, it often targets high-value species like tuna and swordfish which can be economically beneficial. Thirdly, the deep sea fishing typically causes less damage to the seafloor habitats compared to the bottom trawling. Lastly, it can create jobs and support livelihood in the coastal community. However, deep sea fishing also comes with certain challenges. Let's see them. It requires expensive equipments and vessels which can be barrier for small scale fishermen. Additionally, the fishermen need specialized training to operate deep sea fishing equipment safely and efficiently. There is also strict regulations to prevent overfishing and protect marine life which can be challenging to follow. Finally, if not managed properly, deep sea fishing can still lead to overfishing and harm deep sea ecosystems. Now let's see how the government is helping the fishing community to tackle these issues. See the government has started various initiatives. Some important initiatives are listed here. Let's see them one by one. The Pradhan Mandri Matsya Sampada Yojana it aims to boost fish production and double fishingmen's income through the modern practices and infrastructure. It supports sustainable fishing and helps with fish farming and marketing. Secondly, the Park Bay Scheme. It focuses on reducing bottom trawling in the Park Bay area by helping fishermen switch to deep sea fishing. It provides financial aid to buy new boats and equipments for sustainable fishing. Thirdly, the Fisheries and the Aquaculture Infrastructure Development Fund that is FIDF. It provides fund to develop infrastructure for fishing and fish farming. It aims to improve facilities like cold storage, fish markets and processing units to enhance the fisheries sector. So in this discussion, we have seen about bottom trawling and deep sea fishing are the two methods having different impacts on the marine environment. While bottom trawling is efficient but harmful whereas deep sea fishing can be more sustainable if managed properly. We have also discussed the initiatives taken by the government of India. So with this understanding, let us move on to see our next article. Look at this article. Former Myanmar President Tan Chen left for an official visit to China on Thursday, according to Beijing's embassy in Yongan. This is his first foreign trip since the military took power three years ago. Tan Chen, a former general, served as Myanmar's reformist president from 2011 to 2016 under the quasi-civilian government. In this discussion, we have to cover about India-Myanmar relation, threats in border management, Operation Sunrise and then about the free movement passage and also about the cross-border ethnic loyalty. Let us cover all these one by one in our discussion. So let's start with India-Myanmar relation. India-Myanmar share a complex and a multi-faced relationship influenced by geopolitical proximity, historical ties, cultural exchanges and strategic interest. Firstly, the historical ties. India and Myanmar have shared cultural and religious ties for centuries, with the spread of Buddhism being a significant link. Both countries were part of British Empire until Myanmar, that is, then Burma, was separated from British India in 1937. Secondly, let's see about its political relation. See, India was one of the first countries to recognize Myanmar's independence in 1948. India's stance towards Myanmar has evolved from supporting pro-democracy movement to engaging with the military regime, especially for the strategic and security reason. Thirdly, the economic relations. See, the bilateral trade has been growing, with India being a significant market for Myanmar's agriculture produce, timber and natural gas. Major sectors of investment include oil and gas, banking and telecommunication. India has invested in infrastructure projects like Kaladan 
மல்டி மாடல் டிரான்சிட் டிரான்ஸ்போர்ட் ப்ராஜெக்ட் அந்த இந்தியா மியான்மர் தாய்லாந்து ட்ரைலேட்டர் ஹைவே டு என்ஹான்ஸ் கனெக்டிவிட்டி அண்ட் ட்ரேட் Fourthly, let's see about strategic and security concerns. See, the two countries share a 1,643 km long border. Issues such as cross-border insurgency, drug trafficking are the major concerns. Both countries cooperate on counter-insurgency operations. There are regular high-level visits and exchanges between the military officials of the both nations. India provides training to Myanmar's military personnel. Fifthly, let's see about the cultural relations. See, the cultural exchanges are facilitated through initiatives like India-Myanmar Buddhist Circuit, and the scholarships for Myanmar students in Indian universities. A significant Indian community resides in Myanmar, contributing to the cultural and economic fabric of the country. Now let us talk about the recent developments. See, India has adopted a balanced approach towards Rohingya issues, providing humanitarian aid to the displaced while maintaining diplomatic relations with Myanmar. The military coup in Myanmar in February 2021 has posed challenges to India's foreign policy, balancing its strategic interest with international calls for restoration of democracy. Moving on, we shall know about some important factors of interest regarding Myanmar. Lookist policy and actist policy are the India's strategic visions for engaging with Southeast Asia where Myanmar is a crucial gateway. Myanmar's role in Asian impact India's regional diplomacy. Nextly, the regional connectivity projects like Kaladan and Trilateral Highway marks its significance. India's assistance in the times of natural disasters such as cyclone Nargis in 2008 shows the depth of India Myanmar relations. These are some of the important points about India Myanmar relations. Now moving forward, we must know that there are some threats to the border management. Border management between India and Myanmar presents several challenges and threats. Let's see them one by one. Firstly, the insurgency and militancy. Several insurgent groups from India's northeastern states operate along India Myanmar border. These groups often use Myanmar as a safe haven for training, regrouping and launching attacks on Indian soil. Secondly, illegal migration. The porous nature of India Myanmar border facilitates illegal migration. This includes both economic migrants and potential insurgents complicating demographic and security dynamics in the border states. The migration of Rohingya refugees from Myanmar through India's northeastern state poses both humanitarian and security challenges to India. Thirdly, smuggling and trafficking. See, the India Myanmar border is a key conduct for drug trafficking, particularly of heroin and synthetic drugs from the Golden Triangle region. This exacerbates drug abuse problem in India's northeastern states. The border region is also a hot spot for human trafficking with women and children being trafficked for forced labor and sexual exploitation. Fourthly, let's see about ethnic conflict and displacement. The eth ethnic conflicts within Myanmar can spill over into India. leading into an influx of refugees and high rate and tension in the border areas the movement of refugees due to conflict and military operation in myanmar places a strain on resources and infrastructure in india's northeastern states so these are some important points to note about the threats to the border management up next we have to cover about the operation sunrise see the operation sunrise is a significant joint military operation conducted by india and myanmar aimed to tackling the insurgent groups operating along their shared border various insurgent groups from india's northeastern states such as national socialist council of nagaland that is nscnk united liberation front of assam that is ulfa and others have bases in myanmar with the rise of china's influence in myanmar india seeks to strengthen its own strategic position in the region Both Myanmar and India army is conduct coordinated operations to dismantle insurgent camps along the border. So this is all about the operation sunrise. Moving on, we have to learn about the free movement regime. The free movement regime that is FMR between India and Myanmar is a unique bilateral arrangement that allows certain border communities to travel freely across the border. This regime is designed to facilitate traditional and cultural exchanges and support the livelihood of the people in the border areas. It is to facilitate cross-border trade and economic activities that are vital for the livelihood of the border residents and also accommodate the unique needs of border communities who often have familial ties on both sides of the border. Finally, we have to cover about the cross-border ethnic loyalty. Many ethnic groups such as Nagas, 
cookies and misos live along the india myanmar border these groups have cultural familial and historical connections that predate the modern nation state boundaries common languages tradition festivals and religious practices strengthen the bond between these communities across the border insurgent groups from india's northeastern states often find refuge in myanmar exploiting the ethnic loyalties to secure support and sanctuary smuggling of goods drugs arms and human trafficking are facilitated by these cross border ties posing significant security and law enforcement challenges so that's all about this article with this let's move on to our next discussion look at this news article with the monsoon setting in the uttarakhand state disaster management department is planning to conduct a vulnerability study of 13 glacial lakes as 5 of the 13 are in high risk zone the study aims to provide data to help avoid the calamities such as lake outburst such high risk lake are the lakes in dharma lasaryan ghati and the kutiyangti valley in pitorogar district and the vasudara tal lake of dauli ganga basin in chamoli district This is the crux. In this discussion, we are going to see about the glacial lake outburst flooding from our prelims perspective. So, what is mean by glacial lake outburst flood? See, the glacial lakes are the large bodies of water that sit in front of or on the top of or beneath the melting glacier. For example, the South Lonak Lake. In this system, when the glacier withdraws, it leaves behind a depression that gets filled with melt water, thereby forming a lake. The more the glacial recedes, the bigger and more dangerous the lake becomes. Such lakes are mostly dammed by unstable ice or sediment composed of loose rocks and debris. In case the boundary around them breaks, huge amount of water rush down or slide down the mountains, which could cause flooding in the downstream areas. This is called as glacial lake outburst flooding. Now let us see what are the reasons for glacial lake outburst flood. Firstly. the melting of glacier see the rapid melting of glacier due to the rising global temperature is increasing the water level in the glacial lake as we have already seen the increase in the volume of water puts a pressure on the boundary of the glacial lake which consists of unstable ice and rubbles this the breaking of these natural boundaries will lead to glacial lake outburst flooding secondly avalanches and the earthquakes see the landslides or the ice avalanches in the areas near the glacial lake displays large volumes of water This large volume of displaced water breaches the natural dams resulting in glacial lake outburst flooding. Moreover, the extreme meteorological conditions like heavy rainfall, extreme storms and the sudden temperature change can influence the stability of glacial lakes and trigger the flooding. Thirdly, impact of climate change. See the Himalayan Indukush region is a climate change hotspot region. Here, the accelerated glacier melting leads to the formation of glacial lakes. Moreover, the climate change can also increase the frequency and the intensity of cloudburst leading to the glacial lake outburst. Fourthly, the volcanic activity. See the volcanic activities near the glacial regions of the world can increase the chances of glacial lake outburst due to the melting of the glacier. Finally, the anthropogenic reasons. See the modern infrastructures like the dams and roads in the mountainous region intensify geological stress which have led to glacial lake outburst flooding for example chimauli glacial lake outburst flooding of 2021 is mainly due to hydropower projects in that region so that's all about this discussion with this let's move to the next article look at this editorial article from hindu this article talks about the terrorist attack in riyasi jammu and kashmir on june 9 this happened the same day prime minister narendra modi started his third term this attack is similar to 2014 attack in afghanistan both aiming to embarrass india on important political days it also highlights that pakistan has been supporting terrorism in india especially in jammu kashmir for nearly 35 years pakistan's goal has been to pressure india to give up on the kashmir by supporting the terrorist groups india has been working to defend against these attacks through various strategies including military action and diplomacy india has responded with force in some cases like balakot air strike in 2019 and surgical strikes in 2016 but it also needs to be clear about what kind of terror attacks will lead to such responses the article suggests that india should keep sharing information with other countries to show the reality of pakistan support for terrorism this is the crux of this editorial article with this background let us do our main science writing practice let me read out this question analyze the multidimensional challenges posed by external state and non state actors to the internal security of india also discuss the measures 
required to be taken to combat these threats c it comes under gs paper 3 under the syllabus of role of external state and non state actors in creating challenges to india's internal security now to answer this question we can split them into three parts first let us start with brief introduction security challenges today are multifaceted requiring comprehensive and adaptive strategy to safeguard nations india's internal security is threatened by both external state actors such as hostile neighboring countries and non state actors such as terrorist organizations and cyber criminals this can be a sample introduction now moving on to see the body part first analyze about the external state actors in brief firstly the cross border terrorism india has been the victim of cross border terrorism primarily emanating from pakistan groups like lashkar e taiba and jaish e mohammed have been involved in numerous attacks including the 2008 mumbai attack and the 2019 pulwama attack these groups receive logistical financial and ideological support from elements within pakistan aiming to destabilize india particularly in jammu and kashmir secondly the proxy wars state actors often engage in proxy wars to weaken adversarial nation in india's case pakistan support for the insurgent groups in jnk and the northeastern states exemplifies this tactics this not only leads to loss of life and property but also strains india's security apparatus thirdly the border conflicts the line of control with pakistan and the line of actual control with china are the hot spot for military confrontations the 2020 galwan valley clash with china highlighted the potential of such conflict to escalate the threats to the national security fourthly the cyber warfare see the state sponsored cyber attacks from the countries like china and pakistan target india's critical infrastructures government networks and businesses these cyber threats aim to steal sensitive information disrupt services and create economic instability these points you can write about the external state actors now moving on to the second part write about non state actors firstly the terrorist organization non state actors like islamic state and al qaeda pose serious threats through radicalization and recruitment of indian youth they exploit social media to spread the ideology and plan attacks secondly the insurgency movements various insurgent groups in northeastern states and maoist that is naxalite group movement in the central india pose challenges to the state's authority these groups use guerrilla tactics to fight against the government leading to prolonged violence and instability thirdly the organized crime The organized crime syndicates often collaborate with terror groups engaging in drug trafficking, arms smuggling and the human trafficking. These activities fund terrorism and increase internal security challenges. Fourthly, the economic espionage. The non-state actors sometimes in collaboration with the external state actors engage in economic espionage. They steal the trade secrets and intellectual property undermining India's economic progress and technological advancement. Now, coming on to the third part that is the measure to combat these threats you can write the following points firstly strengthening the intelligence see enhancing the intelligence capabilities to better coordination among the agencies like intelligence bureau research and analysis wing that is raw and the national investigation agency is crucial secondly the border security modernizing the border security infrastructure with advanced surveillance system fencing patrolling is essential bilateral and multilateral arrangements with neighboring countries to manage border issues and foster cooperation can also mitigate these threats thirdly counter terrorism strategies adopting a comprehensive counter terrorism strategy that includes deradicalization programs community policing and international cooperation is vital fourthly the cyber security developing robust cyber security policies and framework to protect the critical infrastructure is imperative here public private partnership can enhance the country's cyber resilience and investing in cyber security research and development will help to counter the advanced cyber threats fifthly the economic measures targeting the financial networks of terrorist and insurgent groups through stringent anti money laundering laws and international cooperation can cut off their funding resources sixthly the international cooperation collaborating with international organization and the foreign governments to share intelligence conduct joint operations and extradite criminals will strengthen india's ability to combat external threats so that's all about the body part of the answer now let us move on to the conclusion part here we have to give a positive way forward as follows india must innovate and adapt its security strategies continuously strengthening the intelligence international cooperation and community engagement is essential 
with a comprehensive approach india can ensure that safety of its citizens and uphold democratic values so this is the way you can write an effective mains answer we shall solve another different type of mains question tomorrow so stay tuned with this we have come to the end of the news paper discussion now let's move to our next section that is prelims practice question look at this first question bottom trawling recently seen in news is associated with which of the following option a space exploration option b deep sea fishing practices option c agricultural techniques option d renewable energy source the correct answer is option b deep sea fishing practices look at the second question the park bay scheme is related to which of the following option a development of renewable energy resources in the coastal areas option b promotion of tourism in the park bay region option c sustainable fishing practices and the fisher folk livelihood improvement option d conservation of marine biodiversity in the park bay area the correct answer is option c sustainable fishing practices and the fisher folk livelihood improvement look at this third question With respect to Competition Act 2002 consider the following cities statement 1 an enterprise of indian market is said to enjoy a dominant position if the position enables it to operate independently of the competitive forces prevailing in the market statement 2 an enterprise is said to impose predatory price if it sells the goods at a price below the cost of production to reduce competition in the market which of the statements mentioned above is or correct one only two only both one and two neither one not two the correct answer is option c both one and two let's move to the next question look at our fourth question consider the following pairs of glaciers with rivers first one is bandarpanch yamuna barashingri chenab milam mandagini siachen glacier nubra river zemu manas which of the pairs given above are correctly matched option a 1 2 1 4 option b 1 3 and 4 option c 2 1 5 option d 3 and 5 interested candidates post the answer in the comment section and we shall discuss the answer key tomorrow for this question with this let's move to the next question look at our last question with reference to the indus river system of the following four rivers three of them pour into one of them which joins into indus directly among the following which one of the river that joins the indus directly option a chenab option b jhelum option c ravi and option d satluj we shall also discuss this question answer tomorrow's discussion interested candidates please post the answer in the comment section if you like this video please hit like share and subscribe thank you